Are you tired of politics? I think we all are. And quite frankly, I'm glad I'm not up in Washington, D.C. on this day, which is the 20th, the day of the inauguration. Um, our country desperately needs strong leadership and deserves our prayer support as we pray for those who take office, as we pray for those who be making crit critical decisions in the days ahead. We find politics everywhere. Politics by itself is not a bad word, but uh, we find politics in the Bible. I'll give you an example of that. Samuel was uh, the last of the judges, an era of leadership in uh, Israel. Um, it became a, a problem because Samuel had, first of all, wanted to pass on um, the leadership to his sons, but these guys were not worthy. The Bible describes them in not so glowing terms. Samuel knew they weren't fit. The people knew they weren't fit. Plus the people had another idea. They looked around and they saw all these other city states, other groups of people, all of them had kings. They wanted a king. They wanted what everybody else had. Samuel told them that they had a king. God himself was their king. But they wanted a, a real live, in the flesh kind of king. Samuel was absolutely disturbed by it. He went to God in prayer, and God says, give them what they want. Um, they'll find out. So Samuel was uh, disheartened by it. He had to go to Saul and tell him, I thought you were the right one. You look like the right one. It's interesting in history, you can look back and, and see grave errors in selecting leaders based upon appearance. Just like because you look like a king, Saul certainly looked the part. He was head and shoulders above his co compatriots. But there's a whole lot more to being a good leader than maybe looking like you should be a good leader. So after Samuel had told Saul that uh, his time would end, God sent him on a search. And the search takes him to Bethlehem, just six miles away from Jerusalem, to the home of Jesse, who was a tribal leader, an elder. And in Jesse's home, Samuel believed that God would point out the next king. Well, Jesse had to be honored by this. He must have felt that it must be some great privilege and he certainly had the sons. I mean, he had a very uh, impressive group of young men. And so Jesse began to parade his sons in front of Samuel. And beginning with the eldest, um, Jesse says, well, how about him? And Samuel kept looking at them as they, as they came by. And he said, no, no, that's not. No, he's not the one. No, he's not the one. Finally got to the end, all seven of them. And he says, is, is, is this all there is? Is there not another one? And uh, Jesse says, oh, yeah, the youngest, he's still out in the fields. Um, so Samuel says, would you please bring him to me? I want to I see him. Now, Samuel had received word from, from, from God that he said uh, to his prophet, I don't look at uh, people the way a lot, a lot do. I don't look at their outward appearance. I look at their hearts. I look at their inside, their character, their integrity, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, as we're praying for and searching for the right person to lead Williams, we ought to be looking the way God looks to find the person with the right heart. Well, they did bring David in, the youngest. He's just what we would call a teenager. Maybe not so much look like. I mean, he was a handsome youth, we're, we're told. But um, <laughs> it was obvious to Samuel that this was the right one. So the story unfolds in the book of 1 Samuel as we learn that uh, David is told he's to be the next king of Israel. That would shake anybody up. It's interesting that David uh, simply went back to the field. He had a job to do. He was supposed to take care of his dad's sheep. So that's what he did. But out there uh, tending sheep, he learned some pretty important lessons. 
spent a lot of time in solitude. He had the responsibility of taking care of uh, the valuable assets of his dad. So he had to learn how to take care of those sheep. Some of that was in simply keeping them calm. So he took his lyre, which today would be more like a guitar, and he would sing to the sheep. He'd write songs. You can you can read some of those songs uh, in our own Bible. But he would sing to the sheep and keep them quiet, keep them calm. And that particularly was helpful um, when there was a danger of predators nearby. Well, David didn't just use a guitar to protect his sheep. He became very skilled with a staff and with a sling. And he was able to uh, not just drive away predators, but on occasion kill them and save his sheep and protect his father's investments. All those things would come in handy as David is growing up, maturing, and one day uh, will assume leadership of a nation that he would help unite. One of the first things that happened to David was that uh, he was asked to go to the palace, to Saul's palace. Uh, some people had heard that David had a, a pleasing voice and a musical ability, and he thought, well, maybe he could help out because it was determined that Saul had bouts of manic depression, and it helped to have somebody sing and play, and it would quiet his soul. So David went from watching sheep to being a therapist at Saul's palace. But we know the story gets deeper. We know that other things happen. And David, who, again, is the youngest and does all the menial things, um, there is now a conflict between Israel and the Philistines. We know the story. We know the, the villain. We know all those things about it. But it's interesting just to take this a little bit, a piece at a time. To realize that uh, initially Jesse had told his youngest to uh, prepare food uh, to take to his brothers. The oldest, the three uh, oldest brothers, were now serving in the militia of Israel. Now, Philistines, the Philistines had a professional army. The Israelites had goat herders and shepherds and people who didn't have formal training but they had answered the call and were serving in this militia and were poised to battle, do battle with the Philistines. The Valley of Elah is an interesting place. It has high sloped sides to it um, and a, a valley floor that's uh, almost a mile wide at its widest point. And what would happen is the two, two sides would gather on either slope and then come do battle during the daylight hours. Well, all that stopped <clears throat> when this immense mercenary named Goliath shows up and challenges anybody from Israel's militia to come and fight him. Nobody would because Goliath was immense. I have a, a book I'd recommend to you. It's a series. It's... um by Charles Swindoll, Profiles in Character, and his first one effort was on David. We're told that um, Goliath could have been as tall as nine feet, which would make him, in our minds, <clears throat> think of a preschooler, five years of age, looking up against somebody as tall as and big as Shaquille O'Neal. Get a little bit of perspective there as to what it must have looked like, particularly when the shepherd boy <clears throat> accepts the challenge. When he arrives at the camp, as you well know, he finds everybody in camp. It's during the daylight, and they're supposed to be fighting. There's no fighting going on. He finds out why, and he cannot understand why somebody won't go down there. So they take him, after his brothers give him a hard time, they take him to Saul's tent. And Saul's like everybody else. He's in there hiding and he's not going to go down and fight that guy. You'd think that big, strong, charismatic leader like Saul might have taken the challenge, but he didn't. So David says, what, what, what's going on here? Why are we not taking care of this guy? And they laugh at him, and they criticize him, and David won't go away. He says, I'll fight him. They laugh at him some more. And Saul looks at him and says, 
You can't do that. You cannot defeat him. And David says, I'm not fighting on my own. So Saul's response was to put his own armor on David. Now, David is a small guy, just a teenager. Saul's a full-grown man. As we've said, he's head and shoulders above many of his countrymen. So the, the armor just swallows David, and he can't move. He certainly can't fight. He says, I can't fight this way. So David takes the skills that he had developed and his determination to right or wrong down into that valley. I've heard this story told so many times, so many different vantage points and opinions about what it's really all about. But I think it's pretty simple when you and I think about it. Goliath thought that he was the answer, that he was invincible. David knew he was invincible, not because of his skill with a sling, but because he represented a greater, higher power than Goliath could ever compete with. You see, in the Valley of Elah that day, Goliath never had a chance. You plus God makes a majority every time. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know if there's something as huge and foreboding as a, a Goliath, but I do know this. The God who made you has a plan for your life, and he's not done with you. Philippians 1.6, the God who began a good work in you will complete it. I hope you discover that, for whatever you face, and I hope you have the spirit of David, and I hope you're a person after God's own heart. When it's all said and done, that's what matters most.